Hi, I'm Mark Rudin. Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. Well, in this episode of Building the Bushi Dory, we're going to have a little company in the shop. Michael Mendez came up from Fort Worth, Texas just to learn a little bit about boat building, hang out for a day, and lend a hand. We're going to get the garbage on this boat together, so why don't you all just sit back and relax and let us take care of the work. All right, we got Mike How's it going? up from Fort Worth, Texas. He's come to spend a day with us working on the, the bushy dory here. So Michael and I have been lining off the dory. And that's basically a process of creating uh, what's going to be our finished plank lines. We haven't been at it for very long. How long has it been? Maybe an hour or something like Maybe that? An hour. Okay. <laughs> so you want to take your time with this process. It's, it's not difficult. Um, it's a little bit a uh, little bit of simple math if you want it to be and a whole bunch of just using your eye and your gut feeling. So these battens are just temporary and ideally you choose a batten that represents the plank lap width and that's partially just because it makes it easy to to lay out exactly where the planks are going to go and think about you know how far this plank has to come down and how far the next one has to come up to to work with it. And so you can use even divisions at each frame to start with, but ultimately you have to kind of tweak them all by eye until everything looks right because you never know um, you never know exactly how things are going to look until you're done. And now one little trick that we use when we're building these things is it's hard to visualize what the boat's going to look like when you're right side up. And so it's really common to turn yourself upside down and try and imagine you're standing alongside the boat. And ideally, you could even like lay down on the floor because you're rarely standing there looking at it right from sort of the water line. You're usually looking at it from above, but that's pretty difficult to do with a boat that's upside down and on a mold like this. But you, you can see here our, our garbage plank is quite wide. So we've got like some 16 inch wide plywood planks that we've got made up here. So our garbage are made out of, you know, three eighths inch thick wide plywood and they they're lying on here really nice except I need to do a little bit of shaping here near the um, the forefoot area and I kind of knew that would happen partially it's because planking wants to cup a little bit when you try and twist it so I knew we were going to encounter it quite a bit there and when you have a curved stem trying to get plywood to lay against a curved stem is always a little bit of a challenge so we're going to have half an hour of screwing around trying to just tweak that shape a little bit I think but ultimately, we're on a roll here, and we should have these garbage on by the end of the day quite easily. So next, we're just going to, I think Mike and I have decided that these plank lines are looking really nice to us. We're going to mark off where the termination of them are. And, um, and then we're going to what we call spile for the garbage plank. Now, in this case, because our planking stock is made up, we can actually just lay that plank against the hull and trace it off for the most part. Uh, but the other planks will probably spile for, which is a process of making patterns. And we'll get to that later on in the build. So just, we're just going like that. Oh, okay. These guys. Sorry. That's okay. No apologies. The biggest trick to lining out is just trying to visualize the finished planking. Now the garbage plank is always widest and the plank adjacent to it can be a little bit wider as well because it will look narrow compared to the wide garbage plank. Now the rest of the uppers are usually evenly spaced for the most part, but your shear plank needs to be a little wider than the rest of those because it needs to accommodate a rub rail that's going to go over it, so you have to add that much extra width to the shear plank. Now we can transfer those plank lines down onto our frames and molds. Now we're just going to mark below those battens because we're building upside down that represents the outermost edge of each plank we'll create. I don't think I'm available to get a good scribe because of the clamp. Uh, well, you just get the clamp out of your way. I'm just put a thumbnail, thumb okay. on there. And so, I was wondering, I didn't want to throw everything off. Nope. That's good. And you can just, just pop the front back on so that you don't mess up the next one. So be systematic about it so that you don't miss this here. any this of these guys, right? right? So, you know, work your way down. Work your way down. Did you get these ones? No. Okay. They have already, I'm already messing up this <laughs> Pick a system and follow through on it because the last thing you want is to pop all those battens off just to realize you you missed a couple of spots and you got to throw them back on to get at them again. So 
something as simple as this and messing it up. Well, I have developed an expertise in messing up simple things, so don't feel bad about it. So you were still doing this role, weren't you? I was on this one. Oh, okay. I was still oh, yeah. Have you, moved, have you moved to work in this way now, or have you moved to work in this well, way? Well, after you put the clamp on it. Oh. <laughs> but I still got these two. I'm messing with you. All right, finish these two up. and. Okay, so put some clamps over here. Uh, sure, why not? That makes, it, that makes sense. You don't really have to worry about whether or not they face in or out at this point, because we're basically removing them in a moment anyway. Okay. As we're doing our lining out, we were making a point of turning our clamps inwards as opposed to outwards. That's partially so that we don't obscure a view while laying the lines on and trying to judge whether or not we have good lines, but also in this tight space, every time you walk by the boat, you're going to get yourself hung up on one of these guys if you don't turn them inboard. So it's just sort of something you learn to do the hard way because you keep gaffing yourself on planks sticking or on clamps sticking out the other way. Got many scars on my head to to show for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these little battens here. Choose you know one edge or another to align these guys to. We can just bring them back a hair here. Got to make sure we identify which station we're at. So we'll just working from the bow. We'll call that one. Now that we have all of our plank locations marked out on one side of our mold. We need to transfer them to the other side, and the simplest way to do this is with the tick stick. You want to be careful to align that tick stick carefully to one edge of your frame while you transfer the marks over, and then replicate that on the other side. Once we've finished transferring all of the plank lines on the frames from one side of the boat to the other, we have to think about the stem and the transom. Now it's important that you draw these plank lines onto the face of the stem and the face of the transom because when we go to plank the boat we'll be shaping these areas a little bit and we're going to lose any marks that are on the sides of these parts. Now it's time to get onto planking. Michael and I have wrapped this prepared panel around the mold and we're going to mark it out to create our garboard planks. Okay, so I'm going to hold this into position. So you're going to describe along here and then mark our, our line at the stem. Ready? Okay, yep, I'm ready. Okay. And mark our termination at the... Nope, farther down. Oh, right here it is. Yeah. Now, while I'm still here, I want you to describe along the whole edge of the, the chine, we call Ready? that. Yep. The flat side down. Yeah, just lay the whole pencil down and put some pressure on it on the tip. Okay. And that's it. Keep going. Okay, now you see each of the spots where I've got a line drawn on the bottom, where those fasteners are? Right. Yeah. So see if you can't just give us a little tick at each of those spots. I just, you know, the more reference marks you have in different locations that help you to juggle it into place, no matter where you're looking, the easier it is to get it, get it back where it was later on. Next, Michael's just going onto the boat to mark off our plank widths and frame locations. You want me to release this one? Yep. So as, we, as we're taking this off, by the way, so you take these clamps and just drop them right down there so they're right at hand when we do the next. Okay. There we go. Now we were able to trace the shape of the garbage plank off of the stem, the chine, and the transom directly on the mold but we still have the lower edge of that garboard plank to describe. Michael is putting a finishing nail in at each of the locations where he marked the plank width at the frames. We're going to spring a fairing batten along all of these points and that's going to describe our final plank shape. If you recall from past episodes, I feel it's really important to be careful about where you put that finishing nail. Pick one side of the line or the other or even put it right in the middle. So long as you're consistent, even the width of that finishing nail can make a line you describe unfair. Is that it, or one more over here? One more over here. 
One other thing to notice here is that we've got both plank panels stacked up so that we'll be cutting both garbage planks at the exact same time. So get it. All right, now I just got to get a batten onto there. All right, so what we want to do is we want to make sure we get a fair line. So take your thumb off of there for a second. Okay, so if we, if we just gently push this guy up against it, what we're looking for are anomalies. So we're trying to get a, what we refer to as a fair line. So that might mean that the odd nail doesn't quite touch. And if we were to force it to touch, it would sort of put a little dip in there that, that makes for an unsightly plank line. And so because we're not trying to fit this into, you know, a fixed hole, for instance, we've got wiggle room. So in this case, that one looks good. So I would pinch that there. And the end, obviously, is fine. And in some cases, if there's a lot of shape, we would play around with, with tweaking that end up or down to try and yeah. fair out the curve. This is a very, very straight line. Let that one float. So go ahead and put a, you can, you can clamp that one there. Sight along that batten and just see if you can pick out any odd shapes. Yeah, between um, that second nail and that third nail going away from you, looks like there is a odd shape, yeah. In that space, it looks like we have a, a line going like this. Can you see it? There we go. Now it's more sweeping versus... Okay. I'll go with that. So I'm just going to pop a nail in behind it. I'll just pull that one out. So if that looks really good, then you're just going to take a pencil. And let's get this guy sharpened up a little bit. So we're going to do two things. We're going to start just by drawing a nice line. You don't have to put it like hard up against the edge, but angle it close to vertical. So go ahead and give yourself a nice line. And what I'd suggest is make sure in between, in between the places where it's fastened down is just put a finger on there to keep it from moving. Now watch as Michael draws this line here. I want you to take note of something. Look at the angle of his pencil and right there. You notice at how low an angle he's got that pencil held at? Well, that's a problem. Do you remember my instructions right before he started drawing that line? You don't have to put it like hard up against the edge, but angle it close to vertical. Michael started out pretty good, but as he got farther down the batten, he angled his pencil over more and more. Now, if he hadn't had that batten pressed down firmly, his pencil line probably would have crept underneath the corner of it. Accuracy and craftsmanship comes down to the little tiny details you employ along the way. Okay, beautiful. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to score this as well. And the reason for that is because we're going to use a circular saw to do this cut. We could, mm, you know, it's pretty darn straight. Maybe we'll do this on a table saw even. Yeah, this is something that you don't generally do is use a table saw freehand, but it's something, if your curve isn't too drastic, it's actually a really nice way to, uh, to cut a line. So we'll do that. But uh, the point being is that sometimes you can get the grain breaking out, and so a nice way to undermine that is by just scoring it with a knife. Sometimes it helps to make that in low light conditions. It helps it makes it easier to see that pencil line. Now the one thing you don't want to do is stick a thumb out here where it might you might slip and slice it open because that's a distinct possibility. <laughs> so being careful. As you can see, I'm sort of, I only bring my fingers pretty much in line to where the knife can't get at it. And the and it, it's easy for the grain to grab the edge of that knife and 
throwing you off, especially as you're cutting into the grain. Okay, you don't have to cut hard. We're just trying to score, you know, even just halfway through that first veneer will make all the difference in terms of keeping the edge from being really ratty. Just got to remove our batten here. Just have a look down our line. It's a slightly funny looking line, you know? Did I mess it up? No, no, you didn't mess it up. It's just the way we laid it out. So it's a bit, it's like there's a little bit of a hump right here. And uh, it could have been a fuller, like if I were just whacking this out, I'm not gonna mess with it, but if I were just doing this whole boat by eye, I would never leave a line like that. And it's funny, we couldn't really see that with the batten in place. It's just so close to straight. You can see how there's just sort of a slightly hard spot right there, right? Yeah, that, and that fills out a little over here. Before it turns into a sweep, you know, mm -hmm. before it turns square right there at the... Mm -hmm. uh, I might even, when we cut it, I'm almost inclined to like leave just a hair. I might do that, you know, up in this, up in this zone, right here. Start leave leave a little sixteenth of an inch behind, and then we'll sweeten it up by hand. Yeah, thanks. I think we'll do that. The thing is, you never know if you, you do that and then you get it, get it back on the boat and suddenly it looks like this hump on there, right? Because of the way the shape wraps around. While I am demonstrating cutting freehand on a table saw, I'm not advocating it. It has its risks, especially when you're using a saw that has a higher horsepower like this one. There are some things I do to mitigate those risks. I never set my blade any higher than about one tooth height above the material surface. I only ever do this when I'm working with a plank that has some mass to it and is no more than an inch thick and made out of material that's relatively neutral, such as plywood or red cedar. I wouldn't try this with an oak or a mahogany plank or one that has any real thickness to it in which there's a risk of the wood binding on the blade. I also only use this technique when the curves are very gentle and I wouldn't get nearly as fair a line with a handheld circular saw. The diameter of the table saw blade makes for a fairer line. I work very slowly and very carefully keeping my hands well away from the blade and I'm always ready to hit that stop button with my knee if anything goes awry. So just keep that nice and flat. It's just set for a really light shaving. And what you want to do is just sort of get down low and make sure that we're feeling it to be nice and smooth. And there's just a little bit of a sharp spot right there. If you stand back and take a look at it. Sit right here. Yep. I'm going to just take a few more strokes. Short ones, longer, longer, just to try and uh, whittle that down. See there's a bit of a burn mark on the edge of the plywood? Yeah. See if you can't make that go away. We're not trying to worry about getting touching that line because we've got a pretty good consistent cut that's coming like very, very close to that line. And back here is where I wanted to put a little bit of extra meat on it anyway to sweeten up this shape. So it's looking good. Fly at her. How much pressure do you put on this thing? Well, enough to make good solid contact. And you can skew the plane a little bit in order to if you're having trouble getting it to cut. As long as the full breadth of the edge of the wood stays in contact with the blade, you can probably put more pressure on than that. I can tell just by hearing it. Yeah. But don't don't slam the plane down on it. Every time you do that, you run the risk of it centrifugal force driving that blade down a little bit deeper. Uh -huh. So yeah, so it. just yeah, sliding it's fine. Just, just keep working your way forward. Every time you take a stroke, as long as you feel like you're clearing that that those saw blade marks off, just advance yourself another six inches. Is this more by touch or by seeing? It? Touch. be able to do that with your eye. You got such a nice fair line, you should be able to do it with your eye without even looking at it at the moment. You're just feeling feeling those shape that 
that little bit of material coming off. And of course, then by eye, when you get close to you, where that scarf is, is where we have our slight hump. Right here? Yeah. So give it a few extra right here? So you're gonna, yeah, starting with a good bite right in the middle of that spot, and then take another stroke that's longer, say six inches longer in each direction, and then another one that's, say, a foot longer in each direction. Okay, you must be close to on the money there. Are you? Yeah, pretty close. Okay. We can't uh, lie away 16 feet. So that little gap there is what we're trying to get rid of now. So all I'm worried about now is are we very, you know, on our line or very, very, very close to our line. It feels like we're a little, just getting a little bit below it. But that's part of the difficulty with trying to wrestle a large panel on to the, um, our building form here is, is cause it never, they, they never want to sit quite the way You'd like them to. Yeah. <laughs> just so much tension, so much more tension in them. So you do what you can. Okay, so I'm protruding back here off our line. It's about an eighth. Yeah, it moved a little bit. I think you should be on. Oh, that's pretty darn good. Now we're kind of 16. Okay. Okay, I'm on the money. And you, sir? Yeah, we're good over here. Okay. I want to thank you for watching so far, and you can thank the generosity of my supporters over on Patreon. They kick me a couple of bucks each month so that I can do what I'm doing, which is making videos for you. And if you can be one of those people, I really appreciate it. You can find links in the description or up in the cards. That's those little things that are popping up somewhere up here. All right, now let's go get back to work. just right where we want them. What's it take for then? Well, because we're going to put this plank on with epoxy and we don't want to glue these guys to the plank because they're temporary. And so epoxy does not stick to packing tape worth a damn. We call these plywood buttons. And not only do they work really well for holding the edge of the plank in place, 
but they also locate where the plank needs to lie. That way we can go through our fitting process, springing the plank out or removing it entirely, and we can put it right back in the exact same spot very easily. These buttons can just rotate out of the way and then rotate back whenever we need them. Okay, so don't go too far without just checking your fit. It's looking good. Um, I don't know, I still see a lot of uh, daylight over here. Doing nicely, yeah, there's a ton of daylight. Not really showing through exactly so much as, um, definitely we need to, we've got a, a big gap here, but we aren't to our line yet. So I think I'm confident to say, go ahead and keep taking it down to that line at this point. Right down to, yeah, and I think yeah, and I think you can keep it keep it flush the whole way down. Given how much it's standing off right now, you're safe to do that. All right, so go ahead. Yep, go ahead. You're doing great. That looks really good. Let's see, nice, nice. You're doing great, man. Keep going. So now you're now you're pretty much there at the line. Um, so you're gonna have to think about taking the back bevel off, working the back of the bevel here. So one of the ways you can address working one part of the bevel and not the other is to think about if you look at the mouth of the, the throat of the plane, if if you can work it so that this part where there isn't a throat is hanging over that surface you can't possibly plane that off, right? And so long as your plane is set like very tight, and it is, that blade bit kind of disappears at one edge. So if you're working your way along, you can see, if I take a stroke there, and we look at that shaving, yeah, there. Thickness on this edge, but not on that edge. See how it just turns yeah. to nothing? Yeah. Right, so that's just a, a good indicator that you're pulling material off just one side. Do I don't plug it in. So just pop it on here. Okay. I'll we'll just pop the clamp on here just to snug it up a little. Sweet. Alright, that'll work. You can find one of the 40 pencils I've given you so far today. Yeah. <laughs> Here's one. Yep. Alright, so go ahead and scribe along the inside. Do I need a flat one? Um, this one's kind of flat, but... It, it, you know what, it doesn't matter. Just go ahead and throw a line in there because it doesn't matter too much because we're not cutting it to a finished line. We're just going to be roughing it. When we were cutting out the garboard the first time, we left a healthy margin of error along the stem, the chine, and the transom. And that's so that we could juggle this plank into shape. We knew there'd be a little bit of screwing around in order to get it to fit just right. And now that we've done that, Michael's just going to mark that plank for its absolute final shape. And we'll trim it down to within about an eighth of an inch of that line. And then once the plank is installed and the glue is set, we'll do the final trimming in place. So go ahead and drill a hole right there, maybe about, about an inch deep. What Michael's doing is pre-drilling for the very first fastener we'll use while doing the installation. It's important to be able to re-register that plank exactly where it was during the fitting process. And this fastener will do that for us. Now when we pull that off, I also need you to um, take the other drill bit and make that hole larger. Because we're going to need the screw to be able to pass through there without actually holding up the, um, the without the plank hanging up on it. Okay. Cool. Pop those buttons. Okay. All right. Go ahead. All right. Cool. Let's drop that there. I'll grab the circular saw, you drill out that hole a little bit bigger. Michael's gotten the back of the garboard plank 
wet it out with unthickened epoxy in all of our gluing areas. And now he's working on the edge of the bottom and the frames. So it's especially the edge of this plywood bottom that we need to make sure that we're well wetted out because that will suck up epoxy like crazy. because this is like having an extra pair of hands to take care of this job here today is, is huge. Yeah, it seems like it'd be pretty hard alone. <laughs> I'm so used to doing it alone, I can't imagine doing it any other way half the time. But um, you're really good to work with, so that's made it exceptionally easy and pleasant. Some of that thickening stuff? Yep, make another batch of epoxy, grab a fresh cup. Fresh cup. And use the big, the largest hardener bottle there. Just make sure you plunge those plungers down all the way. One pump each. One of the one of the resin, the biggest one, one of the next size down. This is when all that previous preparation, all that thinking ahead, all that planning, all that careful execution comes together and it makes building something like this a really pleasant experience. We've got this covered in a bunch of glue that's going to kick off in about 15 or 20 minutes. So the clock is ticking, but look at us, we're relaxed, we're having fun, we're having a laugh, we're enjoying ourselves. And it's all because we took the time to make sure we were doing things right. None of this is the result of having a vast amount of expensive equipment, or even a vast amount of previous knowledge. It's simple ingenuity. Simple logical thinking, a little bit of planning ahead, and paying attention to the details of the things I did before. The experience of building this boat isn't vastly different than my experience of building my very first boat. Over 25 years and a hundred some odd boats have gone by, but it comes down to the same basic principles. Being patient, doing a little bit of research into areas that I'm ignorant about, and taking my time and trying to execute things carefully. I can do it, you can do it. After all, the only difference between an amateur and an expert is that the amateur hasn't yet made all the mistakes that the expert has. But given some time and some practice, you'll make some new mistakes and hopefully you'll learn from them. So we've used some screws here. In a few cases, we've used fender washers under these screws. Probably should have used fender washers everywhere, but we didn't. So that's just to tack that plank in place and we just, the buttons are holding it at the other end. We're going to just let epoxy hold it for now and I'm going to add fasteners later on. So next we need to think about cleaning all this squeeze out from the joints. I have a golden rule about squeeze out. You scrape it up, don't smear it down. And if you can't deal with it neatly now, leave it alone and you can take care of it with a heat gun later. Okay, that was a really successful glue up. Everything went together nicely, everything fit. The cleanup went really nicely. It's been about 24 hours now. I can start removing all of these fasteners. This epoxy is gonna hold everything together just fine. I just wanna say thanks to Mark for having me out here and teaching me a little bit about uh, working on this boat. And thank you, Michael. It was great having you in the shop. I really enjoyed your help and I really enjoyed your company. Well, that's it for this episode, folks. Don't forget to subscribe and Hit that bell so you know when the next video is out, and I will see you later.